talk loud. Hello, everybody. Well, I hope this thing is on. It looks like it's buffering. Are we on? I don't know. I'm going to have to check. I'm checking. I don't have your mic on. I haven't got I it forgot yet. about it. If you want to get it for me. I have, I'm not seeing it yet, but it, there's usually a 30 second delay. All right. Hello, everybody. Looked like we were buffering, so a little bit slow, and I'm getting old. I forgot my microphone, so I think Brother Gary's going to help me out here. Uh, it's good to see you in the Lord's house, and uh, <laughs> we're getting all geared up. Uh, as you know, Franklin Graham is going to have a march on Washington, D.C. Uh, this coming Saturday, the 26th. And uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, thank you, Brother Gary. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn has uh, a program also planned called The Return. He's going to be in Washington on Saturday, and they're going to have a march and have special prayer for our nation. It's, it's a call back. Uh, a return to God, a, a repentance. You know, I wonder why anybody's too proud to repent. As believers, repentance is our friend. It helps us keep a short list between us and God. Uh, we don't want to have anything between the Lord. And we just say, Lord, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me. Very few days in my life or when I go to bed of the night, I'm not praying and asking the Lord uh, if there's anything in my life today, if we've come short or missed your mark, Father, just wash us and cleanse us, and Lord, just, just let us be ready. And so uh, repentance is a real big need in the United States of America, and not only just for the country, for much of the church world, that we could just repent for our apathy and and uh, uh, the Bible said some having a form of godliness but deny the power thereof from such turn away. There's always room. I think about the scripture that says of the Lord, will thou not revive us again? Will you not come, Lord, and revive us? And, and really, we're not waiting on the Lord. Uh, we're a people called to prayer. I thank God for my spiritual heritage. I, I thank God that I was fortunate enough to be trained by a people who truly practice prayer. Uh, my my uh, training in the Lord in early church life, I mean, there was always a prayer meeting about something or uh, needs to pray about or lingering in the altar and uh, talk about praying through. Uh, I was trained in all those terms. And also, I came from a people who, who practiced uh, fasting, prayer and fasting. Then you read in the Word of God, and Jesus said this thing, uh, these things don't go out but by prayer and fasting. So what is the issue of prayer? Prayer, it, it's really a matter of, of discipline. It's a matter of consecration. Uh, it, it's it's. Uh, I, I think probably it's an area where a lot of people, if we're not careful, we can suffer condemnation. We think, well, if if we're not like the intercessors of old who spent two, three, four hours a day in prayer, we've not prayed. I was thinking about that today. Some of my prayer time and uh, time with the Lord and. I was thinking again about Elijah, and Elijah uh, on the mountain, uh, outnumbered by all the prophets of Baal, uh, he prayed those 63 words, uh, and fire fell out all over that mountain didn't take a long time to say 63 words, but I think more importantly than the number of words, uh, because you see, prayer isn't just about vain repetition. I mean, repetition. You know, the Bible talks about vain 
see that your prayers not just be vain repetition. You know, some people think by many words or much words they would be heard. But prayer is about relationship. So it isn't about having to pray for an hour or two hours. It's understanding that we commune with the Lord. Uh, we, we come to God and we seek Him. And we're a people called to prayer, called to the house of God. So I, I jumped ahead of myself and started getting in all this elaboration about prayer. But I want to uh, really encourage, and uh, we've got all this writing all over the country. Uh, there's going to be writing in Kentucky tonight. And uh, I just think it would be awesome this Saturday in Pittsburgh, Kansas, Saturday the 26th from noon until two in the afternoon. There's gonna be several pastors, churches, and you, you're, you're invited to come. And we're gonna be down there at the pavilion on 2nd and Broadway. And we're gonna have uh, two hours of organized prayer and different ones will be praying in, in different areas. I have an area that I'll be dealing with and other pastors and other lay leaders and people. If you want to pray, I, I just think if we would have an amount of people uh, descend on our city praying for our country and uh, praying repentance and a return to God and a hunger and, and, and thirst for the Lord, if we had people turn out for that, it'd be a powerful thing. So we want to invite you to uh, come out for that prayer time. When we pray, God works. When we pray, the Lord moves. And uh, when we do our part, he'll do his part. And I've heard it said before, if we, if we don't, he won't. And, and there's an element of truth to that. The Bible says, draw nigh unto God, and in return... He will draw nigh unto you. Uh, and I have found in my own prayer life, if I'll take the step, the Lord will always be there. If we will, if we will adventure the step, uh, God, God's going to meet us there. I want to call your attention, if you would, uh, to Psalms 2 and 8. And here, just in, in just a short few days, I've been in conversation with people about the coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church. Now that's not our subject tonight, but we, we just talked about how exciting the days we live in, the prophetic hour we live in. And, I, and I've had at least two different families and two different people tell me, well, if it was just up to me, I'd be okay if the Lord came tonight, but I have family. I have family that I, I said, you know, I feel the same way. But the truth is, folks, one of these days, Jesus is going to come ready or not. And so our praying and our prayer time, Psalms 2 and verse 8, it, it, it's a beautiful uh, thought relative to prayer. And it says, ask of me and I shall give you the heathen for thine inheritance. You know, I think we could meet at the immigrant park this coming Saturday for a couple of hours of prayer and pray for our country to return to God and pray for uh, all of us to draw nigh to God and pray for people who doesn't know the Lord. This verse of scripture says, simply ask and I'll give you the heathen for an inheritance. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth labors into his harvest. And he said, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thine possession. And, uh, you know, we pray about a lot of things. You know, we first pray for our salvation. Pray for the salvation of our children. Pray for the blessings of God in our life. We, we pray for our health. Uh, there, there's just a lot of things in life uh, that we pray for and pray about. I want you to turn with me now to uh, 1 Timothy 2. 
And, and also, I, I want to invite you to jump in here with me. And if there's some things that you would like to share, uh, the Bible said that we ought to pray for all men. How many of you thank God that you've had prayer partners in your life? You've had people that's prayed with you and for you and over you, and you've prayed for your family. Speaking of prayer, Sister Karen has not been well. Brother Cliff Allman is back in the hospital. Brother Cliff is not physically well tonight. Uh, and so, you know, we just have a whole lot to pray about. Uh, but never been an hour in our country where prayer is more vital than tonight. And uh, we have been instructed uh, who to pray for, how to pray. And so what, what is in my heart tonight is to stir us up on the subject of prayer. Uh, maybe stir some up on Facebook uh, to invest themselves in the opportunity of prayer downtown Pittsburgh this weekend. And also in this vital time in our country uh, to pray and also much of the church world uh, we need a stirring and we need a fresh uh, visitation of the Lord. So I want to start reading in 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 1. And again, jump in here and help me. He said, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, and that's, that's simply a fancy way of humble, sincere prayer. He's saying, Prayers, intercession, and giving thanks be made for all men. Certainly we need to do that for our national leaders, for our state and our local leaders, and uh, said for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Well, friend, there's a lot of cities tonight that are not living, living peaceable and quiet. And... Uh, Probably not a whole lot of prayer other than maybe believers that are sprinkled out in the mount among that, that country and maybe praying for set, uh, safety. But let's look at it. He said, uh, for, for those in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Uh, you know, one of the prayer areas for us that we could pray for a country who would fall on her knees one more time, that, that the peace of God and that godliness and honesty uh, could be a part of life. He said, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. If God called his house a house of prayer and we meet in his house, uh, every implication then is that we're a people of prayer. And we quote scriptures like, pray without ceasing, men ought always to pray and not to faint, right? And uh, so we just wanna build you up on prayer. Anybody have an observation uh, about prayer tonight? If we pray to the Lord of harvest, we're absolutely praying for the lost to be saved. He's talking about praying for leaders and praying for a peaceful life. This verse even goes on to say that all men would be saved. Are there areas that you have a burden to pray for? Anybody here have particular areas of concern or, uh, or burdens that you have on your heart and your mind to pray about? Our nation has been my prayer for years now. to pray for America and pray for our nation. Amen. I, I believe we're instructed to do that. Uh, we're, we're one of the few countries in the whole world that we have, we can pray. We still have the liberty to pray. We don't have to worry about getting arrested for it, as of right now. And I think one of the griefs of, of our lives, and you know, I'm out of the baby boomer generation, and we were really taught patriotism and, I, and I'm, I'm a patriot tonight. I love my country. I know Brother Rob Lewis, and I always felt like Brother Rob's one of my spiritual sons. I, I love him. 
Uh, but he used to tell me, now, Pastor, you're not home yet. You're just passing through. I said, I know, Rob, but I love America. You know, I, I love my country. And so you can have mixed emotion. But while I'm here, uh, I'd like to pray over it, plead the blood over it. But, but I'm a patriot. Uh, but first to God, I mean, hey, we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. We know that. But uh, I, I believe we're to serve our generation and to pray over it and, and make a difference. And I do. I, I grieve over my country. What we see going on in this nation is, is staggering. And, and I'm not trying to be holy, but I've been talking to some other leaders and pastors and evangelists who have since the I, I have had this continual and I've had some of them say you know when I've had that burden or that unsettling and a constant pressure on my spirit in areas you know I go and try to pray it through and feel that relief and, and I told because I told them I said I, I can't get relief from this it is just been a constant and they, they said that is exactly what we've been experiencing I was telling brother Gary Wilson today in the office I said well if it takes that pressure to keep us on our face so be it uh, but but we need to pray brother Gary did you have anything else so and we're going to do that on Saturday you know people want to complain and people want to bus and people want to do this. We can do something positive Saturday. We can come together in the spirit of unity and, and we can pray for this country and pray for our churches. Well, we, we can take it so lightly because we were born and raised in the United States of America. But if you've ever been to a foreign country, it's a completely different world. Well, and that's why a lot of the Hispanics have have risen up over these recent months telling us you don't want to go the way of socialism and communism because it has absolutely destroyed our countries we come to america uh to be free and so you know they're praying america will shake herself and get a hold of god so Anybody else have any areas, particular areas of prayer? It doesn't just have to be with the Nate Sister Shirley. I think that America was founded on that very thing that you're talking about. Absolutely. We were founded. So freedom of religion. Absolute freedom of religion. Right. And so we need to do that. And they were a praying people. And that's why God blessed it and anointed. And, and if we don't find it in prayer, we, we won't have it. He said, pray that you can, I just read it to you, pray that you can live a, a quiet and peaceable life. And where, and, and you know, I think it's sad too that our country, every idol God has, has come into America, every foreign religion, while we have been a people open to others coming uh we have still known that our founding has been a, a biblical uh founding in, in god the father god the son god the holy ghost in other words the god of abraham isaac and jacob and and as a christian nation as a people who can pray and and that is uh, our founding so we, we're going to be praying about that. We're going to have a lot of subjects we'll be praying over. Uh, anyone else have any uh, Sister Sandy? I've noticed, and I'm sure we all have, that uh, what, what creeped into the world and also creeped back into the church. Right. One of the most seemingly uh, you know, good things that happened in the but it's deadly, and that is basing uh, so many decisions and outcomes on feelings and I come from Italian background we have feelings right but facts and truth has got to be our foundation truth of the gospel truth of the word has got to be our foundation not on not on feelings because this country is founded on you know Christian philosophy and, and traditions and Supreme Court, every part of our government was founded on those precepts 
And that is what's under attack today. It's our very foundation mm -hmm. is a Jewish Christian foundation established from the word of God. And what I see so much in the world and also oftentimes in people that I run into is the emotion of the feeling instead of the truth of the word. And Sister Sandy is, is talking about how emotions goes to play in, in so many areas and at the expense of, of truth. And you know, that, that is an area that uh, I was taught about and trained in that where people, uh, you know, want to say, well, I had this experience, okay? And we know sitting here tonight we would all testify, we know the experience of salvation. But going back to the point of, of our sis, any experience that we would claim that we would have, any emotion that we would claim that we would have, has to go back filtered through the truth of God's word. And we live in a world and a culture today, if it feels good and, uh, you know, do it. Uh, but uh, it's not experience or emotion over truth. And, and our, our country, uh, we're in a real struggle. And, and I've had, here again, I mentioned about people, different ones that have said, well, I'm ready for the Lord to come accept my family. I've also had people express the thought, well, who do you believe? Who, well, you know, what do you believe? We're in a day, friend, here's, here's who you believe. Here's what you believe. All this confusion and chaos, everything going on in our world, uh, settle it in prayer and get your book out and, and seek out the truth and, and settle the issues there. Okay, so does anybody else, you know, we, we it's God's will for, for people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Sister Sandy just walked on that, that truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ. And here's what I was thinking about relative to this verse of scripture. Uh, we, we're just getting primed up and pumped up and getting ready. Uh, for this special prayer time and the activities, uh, what's going to be taking place in Washington. And uh, here uh, it said, one God, one mediator. You think about this. When you go to the throne and you approach the Father in prayer, his son, our Savior, who bought and purchased the church, who bought and purchased your salvation and redemption, who is your captain, the chief shepherd of your soul, the author and finisher of your faith. When you pray, he picks up your prayer and your intercession along with the Holy Ghost. Romans 8, 28 said, we don't know how to pray, but the spirit knows how to pray through us. But it brings my heart great joy to realize that when I pray before the throne, my mediator is there joining, taking our prayer right in to the very throne room and the presence of God. And, and, and here, tied right to this exhortation for prayer, exhortation for intercession, the results that it'll bring to a nation and a people who will do it, and some of the reasons we do it, even for the lost and that people come to the knowledge of truth. Hey, I think Saturday we ought to pray, God, give America the knowledge of truth. Give us, revisit us in revelation of our founding, right? And we have the Lord who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I'm adorned, uh, ordained a preacher, an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity, truth, reality. He said, I will therefore that men what? Everywhere not just in Washington, but in Pittsburgh, Kansas, that men everywhere would lift up holy hands without wrath 
and doubting. God wants us to pray. God's called us to prayer. Now, I, I brought some a, a observations tonight. I've already mentioned, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due season. I was reading that today, Brother Tom, and praying over it, and it just kind of jumped out at me. You know, I've always thought about the due season, the due season, like God has a due season. And it really hit me kind of in a new and a fresh way. God doesn't necessarily choose your due season. You choose your due season by pressing into the heart of God. If we humble ourselves under his hand, if we place ourselves there and we pray, he said, due season. Well, there's no greater due season than when the Lord finds his people humbled before him in prayer, seeking answers, seeking direction, seeking revival, seeking repentance, seeking renewal. That's a due season. And I want to tell you, America's in a place, Brother Don, we're in overdue for a season of refreshment and a move of God. And it's not going to come without repentance uh, your Bible and my Bible said, he that hungereth and thirsteth that the righteousness shall be filled. And uh, that, that won't be found with, without a, a, a turning to the heart of God. And so I, I think there's room there uh, for us to believe that, that a due season uh, can be birthed when we're in prayer. I was thinking about Peter and John when they were heading to the temple to pray. The scripture gives us every indication that they were men of prayer and that routinely in the discipline of their life, they were praying. Then I was thinking, Brother Space, about Jesus. When Jesus faced his greatest hour, greatest crisis, you might say, and it was Gethsemane, all that he came to accomplish, all of the work that he came to do was going to be fulfilled in just a few days with his death at the cross, right? And when he was in Gethsemane, he brought Peter, James, and John, right? That inner core of disciples with him to pray. They, they were close to the heart of God and, and seemed like had a little more intimate position there. And Jesus said, hey, sit here, right here and wait. And I'm going to step over here ways and I'm going to pray. And they could have joined him in prayer because he said, watch and pray. But Jesus went and prayed and the greatest burden of his soul and life, a prayer even really unto death, and he came back and they were sleeping. I want to make a note. At Jesus' greatest hour of need, that inner circle that he brought around him who could have prayed with him and stood with him, at Jesus' greatest hour of need, they fell asleep when it was time to pray. I was reading that the other day and it was just like God dumped this in my heart over that verse of scripture. I'm gonna say it again and I do it on purpose. At Jesus' greatest hour of need, those who should have joined him in a prayer were asleep. They fell asleep on him. He went back to pray, came back, tried to rise them up. Hey, get up, it's time to pray. But they were heavy with sleep. You find that in the Gospels. And he went back to prayer, and they went to sleep again. And then finally he came back, and he said, hey, get up. Go ahead and wake up. You know, sleep on, old oh, sleepers, right? But now rise up because the one that's going to betray me is at hand. No more time to pray. Here, here's what just, oh, overwhelmed me. At our greatest hour and need, we're asleep when we ought to pray. The church world, I'm talking America even. At our greatest hour of need, Honey, we need to watch and pray. We need to stir ourselves. We've got an event planned for our community. All of the COVID, all of the stuff we've been through. 
We've got an opportunity. Hey, if people are concerned about it, hey, the world has mandates. You know what I mean? But here's what we can do. We've always said, wash your hands, wear a mask. You want to wear a mask, wear a mask. You don't want to wear a mask. The world is out spitting, cussing, fussing by the hundreds, right? Doing every damnable thing and not one little, well, there are a few leaders, but most won't rebuke it, right? Well, here we've got an opportunity to gather in the name of the Lord for a common good and common cause to call on the name of Christ for these days. And so, hey, we want to pump you up to that. So there, they had their opportunity to pray with the Lord and they were asleep. Then I was thinking, turn with me to Acts the third chapter. Can you do that? Let's, let's just take and, and linger there just a minute. Somebody else have any observation or you want to jump in here and share a little bit? Oh, do, do you have a particular area or a burden? How many of you know prayer will pierce the darkness? Amen. How many of you know prayer is a weapon? You know another weapon that we have, not only is it a weapon that we pray, but unity is a great and a powerful weapon. And if I was a prophet, this is what I would be prophesying. And that is the same divider that's working against America wants to come in and divide the people of God. Now, if we stand for truth and people want to be divided, if we're separated because of truth, you just have to let the chips fall where they may. But if, if, if we let the enemy bring trickery through division that, that, uh, stops and hinders unity then we've just been fooled and, and it's foolishness but I do believe it's a weapon that the enemy is going to use in the end days but but prayer Jesus was struggling in prayer his sweat become as as if big drops of blood the disciples were struggling in prayer because they couldn't stay awake to pray right at his greatest hour of need they wasn't praying with him and as our, our greatest hour of need, if we don't plan it, then we're not praying to him. Let's look at Acts, the third chapter. This is such a rich area. How many of you know prayer and power goes hand in hand? Prayer and deliverance goes hand in hand. Prayer and, and revival. Prayer and renewal. Prayer and righteousness. I mean... Friend, we can't accomplish really anything without prayer. How many of you prayed the Lord would be with you this day? Amen. Yeah. He would lead us and guide us. And, uh, you know, prayer in the position, prayer is an attitude. And prayer prayer is is our our the way we carry ourselves before the Lord. You may not be in an altar down on your knees 24 7 but you can you it, it's a lifestyle it's just a tone and an attitude all day long we we look to the lord calling upon him uh but this prayer effort this weekend is going to be for two hours a concentrated specific time of prayer that we can unite our hearts together for a common cause while there are people, all of us can't be in Washington this weekend. But I'm going to tell you, there's going to be prayer meetings all over this country. There's going to be little places called Pittsburgh. And there's going to be places called Joplin. And there's going to be places who are going to have march and prayer meetings all across our country. It's going to happen just like it's happening here. And it's all going to be for the common purpose, repentance and return calling interceding for leaders and for God's hand and, and intercession for the church God send your Holy Spirit God refresh us come visit us God come among us come do your will and, and do your work well let's catch up with a couple of men uh, who, who had prayer on their heart can we do that Acts 3 and 1 now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. This is Acts the third chapter, verse one. So here's two brethren going to the church, if you will, 
and it's the hour of prayer. Sounds to me like prayer was scheduled. Sound to me like there was a particular place they were going to, and, and it, it suggests in here that it was routine. It was a spiritual discipline in their life, okay? And, and it was the ninth hour. That was the hour of prayer. And here they are, heading for prayer. Why do we dread prayer? Why do, why do we dread prayer? If we look at it legalistically, if we look at it, we're insufficient, we never pray enough, or we won't do it right, it, it, can, it can be a, a drudgery rather than a joy. Man, who would think that the king of glory and the mediator between God and men would invite us into his presence to spend an hour of prayer with him and ask him. He just said, come and ask. Come and seek me. In the hour that you seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Seek my face. Well, here they are. They're doing it. And, and while they were heading to the temple for prayer time, there was a certain man laying from his mother's womb carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. I was thinking, I, I bet that was a beautiful gate out there by the temple. Hey, it don't matter how beautiful the temple is. Doesn't matter how beautiful the gate is. If you're the one that has to be carried there every day and basically can't help yourself, you're lame. You say, man, what a beautiful setting. Was anything shaken? Anything going on? Here is a man laid outside the temple at the gate while the saints of God are inside the church praying. Let, let's just let, let's let some imagination. Let's, let's look at this story. Now they're going to walk past him, right? Right at the gate of the temple, that beautiful, that gate called beautiful. And man, they got a mission. They're going to go to prayer. God only knows who will pass heading to second Broadway this weekend for prayer time. Who all might be there, maybe onlookers, Wonder what's going to happen, man. It'd be something if if people come out of the city and and take this time. Who knows what God could do? Well, here Peter and John run right into this lame man, and he was known. I believe Peter and John had seen him before. I believe they they knew he was the man that laid there lame, just on the doorstep of the church. I wonder how many lame people we have just on the step of the door of the church, just outside of the hour of prayer, just around the perimeter. But on this day, it was going to be different, this day. And they started to go in, and this lame man said, hey, guys, do you have two bits? How many knows what two bits is? <laughs> hey, we're, we're all mostly from the crowd that should know. <laughs> hey, do you got two bits? Huh? Begging alms. He had a need. But you see his need. You see what America thinks she needs tonight is really what she doesn't need. It's not about a buck. It's not about one more fix-it program. We need a touch of God. Amen. We need to return to the Lord. We can sit at the doorstep of the church and beg for a handout while we're crippled and lame and prayerless until we die, never really having our need met. But I want to tell I, I just felt a witness in my heart. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What he needed was housed within these men of prayer. And I want to tell you, church, what America need is housed within you people of prayer. What America needs is not another handout. What America needs is a hand up reaching to an eternal God that, that waits uh, to be asked for divine intervention. Amen. And repentance is the place to, to start. Lord, I'm sorry we haven't prayed. I'm sorry we haven't called on you. I'm sorry we've let every idol of God, every, every false and fake religion, every lie of hell come to this country. 
You say, well, we're broad, we're wide open, we're open to all people. Yeah, we are, but we don't do it at the denial of our founding and who we are and that we need God. Okay, let's get back to the story here. So here, here's two men with an answer and a man in need. Right? And he had been laid there daily. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked alms. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John. Now I don't know how you would teach this. But I want to tell you, I think this time, at this moment, Peter saw that man different than he ever had. You see, here's the thing about it. When we're a praying people, when we're fresh in our prayer life, we'll see things we've never seen before. Amen. When we come out of a prayer closet, Sister Charlotte, when we've had a fresh touch of God, one thing that we've looked at with maybe a certain attitude or didn't really see the need, when you get a touch from God, you'll look at the same thing and you'll, it, it'll break your heart. You'll say, my God, I never understood it. I never saw it that way. We need that kind of awakening in America. And if it doesn't start at the house of God, it's not going to start out there. Huh? It needs to start here so we can go out there and help them. They're lame. They're, 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 they're beyond help other than the, the people of God praying and interceding for God to move. And on this day, I really believe something turned over in Peter. Have you been there? Have you been there where God quickened you in a moment? Maybe something you had walked past, but, but it was different because God, the Spirit began to do something in that occasion. He looked at him. I would submit to you, he probably asked him for offerings before, handouts before. I, 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 it wouldn't be hard for me to believe that because I believe they were regulars to go in there to the hour of prayer, right? And Peter's eyes fastened upon him with John and said, look on us. Saints, I don't mean to be ugly, but what does the world see when they look on us? Are they seeing us go to the house of God? Are they seeing us go to the house of God at all? Do they know we're going to pray? Do they know they can ask for help and get help? I mean, man, we can do a lot of digging in this verse of scripture, huh? But Peter, this day, I would submit to you, the Holy Ghost stood up in Peter that day. It was going to be a different day. I wouldn't want to brag, but that day that woman came in Fort Scott like this, and I didn't want to obey God. When she walked in the house, and I can tell you before the very altar of God, and she just immediately, I saw her, and it was like poorly and compassion. Something turned over in me, but, but I wasn't to, totally turned, tuned in. But I remember that I saw her, and I noticed it, and God tried to quicken something. We had a glorious service. It was homecoming for us. We had pastors there and, and had brush arbors there and uh, watched people get saved, newly saved, and and. I didn't know this woman, knew she was from the city, but that's about all we knew. But God tried to quicken something and I went through the whole service not even wanting to obey God and, and actually went through the service, disobeyed the Lord, turned the service back to the preacher, had a platform about as high as this one. Boy, but the Lord touched me, Sister Shirley, one more time and I realized you, this is God. And you better obey God. I could have made it flowery and pretty. I could have went back to her. And I could have said, thus saith the Lord, you're the one and God wants to. I knew that I knew that I knew. But I stood up. I was with my wife. Sister Diane was there. And I just simply stood up. And I said, you know, I pointed up to the pastor. I said, if I was here this morning, knowing I was talking to her, I said, and I had a deed, a touch for God. I said, I'd call on this pastor. I'd call on this church and I'd have them pray for me. Guys, them words no more than barely fell out of my, first time Bill Fagan was in our service 
uh, and what he got was Sister Norma, and they were married. And I told that story, first time I ever met Bill, and I was telling the story, and he hollered out, you know, we all love Brother Bill, no Brother Bill, and that's just him. He said, I know that woman, I know that woman. And it just <laughs> verified my story and uh, of, of what happened. And the minute I said that, she bounded out of her seat in that little church building up there on the hill. And she come running by me like a duck waddling, just like this, her little head. And she couldn't stand up. In no ways, like the spirit of infirmity, bowed over the spirit of in no ways could lift herself, just that kind of a deal. Boy, when she got past me, that Holy Ghost stood up in me, and I jumped out in that aisle behind her and made it into the altar. And the preacher was undoing the oil bottle, right, anointing him with oil. We were doing what we was trained to do. I don't, I, 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 he was still up on the podium, but we crossed hands for oil, and I went like that towards her, never got to touch her. He touched her. Amen. And instantaneously, miraculously, in a, in a moment's time, he broke her loose. And she walked out of that church that day straight as an arrow. And you know what it was from? Obedience and somebody prayed. Right? Amen. Look right here. Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John. Church, listen. If we don't look at America's condition, if we don't look at the condition of the church world, if we don't fasten our eyes on it, we're never going to come to a, a revelation or an understanding of how important and vital and how big the need is. But I believe God helped Peter and John see that that day. Something turned over, and I pray, God, Help us, help us see this hour. Help us see the need, God. Help us see that you're calling us and we're the hope and we're the answer and you have the power and, and, and God, you can do it. You can put our feet and legs back under us. You can take the lame and make them walk again. You can do, God, if we'll pray and we'll believe you, God, you can do great and mighty things. And so look how this develops. And the man, I believe the man sensed something. So they ain't give me that kind of attention before. They walked by me. They went in that church. This man ain't ever looked at me like he looked at me today. Well, Peter had never seen him like he saw him that day. May God help us. May God help us. Prayer. What did we pray? 2020. God give it. Hey, after all, this might be about vision 2020. Give us the vision to see the lame and the broken and the undone all around us. Maybe it is about getting our eyes open. Maybe God had a plan the whole time. Tumped our card upside down. Down put our life in disarray, said, I'll cause you to see, I'll get your attention. Peter, he saw him, and that man, he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something of them. Saints, what, what can America receive from us? What could Pittsburgh receive from us? Have we come from the hour of prayer? Have we, have we come from the presence of God? Are we going back to the hour of prayer in the presence of God? He, he, he asked, expecting, you know, prayer, prayer, not only is it important that we come and ask God, Brother Ben, we can even expect God to answer our prayer. We can expect God to answer. This man asked, and he was expecting to receive something. How many of you know more and more in our culture, it seems like there's people on the entries of stores and, and around cities and towns with cardboard signs, right? We'll work for food. Am hungry. Was a vet. Can you help me? Can you do something for me? 
Most drive by, once in a while, somebody stops. Someone said it's a scam. I always looked at it like this. If I did it out of sincerity with my heart, not that any of us want to be scammed, then that's between them and God, right? Yeah. Now look at it. Look, look here. To receive something of them. The key is, what did they have to give him? What was that something they were going to receive? Do you see that, saints? Something. He thought he needed to be healed of his lameness. He thought that was his greatest need. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. He may have said, fellow, we don't have two bits to our name. Huh? Mm -hmm. We ran out of quarters last week. We don't have anything to offer you, man. In that sense, he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. You know, church, we can never give to America what we don't have ourselves. Right? We can't give to some somebody something we don't have. You know, someone said, well, I'd help you. I just don't have anything to give. And you know what we do? We say, well, bless you. Maybe next time. We understand. Somebody told us today about the woman with the mites. Right, Sister Diane? Huh? Jesus stood over by the treasury just watching, observing. The big flash didn't move him. But the little lady that gave out of her need, she needed that more than she needed to give it, but she really needed to, more to give it than to keep it for the blessings of the Lord, right? Amen. And he was more blessed by her giving out of her need my God. I, well, anyway. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I read today when the sons of Sceva was trying to deal with that demon possessed, right? The sons of Sceva had heard Paul say, I adjure you in Jesus' name, come out of that, Right? They had heard the name, but they weren't walking in prayer power. They weren't walking in relationship. They tried to cast that devil out. They didn't have nothing in them to do it. And you remember what the devil said to them? And I wrote, I've got a note right here in my, my uh, notes right here. It's Acts 19, 13, 15. I said, are you known in hell and by your praying? And the devil said, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? I believe that lame man said, man, the preachers are coming. They're going back to pray again. Maybe they could help me. I'll just ask them for two bits. They said, buddy, we don't have no money, but what we do have, we'll give you. Makes me want to weep right now, and I thank God. Do we not have anything to give to America? What do we have? What could we give to America? We hope. could get, huh? Hope. Hope, right. Just convenient. My mother had a little red bird setting out on a stone. You know, I'm just a sentimental fella. And she had a little red bird setting on a rock. One of these little plastic things you can buy in a store well of course after mom passed away and that was on her porch it become me more to me and then the hope you know i've got to deal with hope anyway years ago one of my lowest points i looked at that word and he said hold on and pray every day i'd never seen that but that day i looked at that word he said hold on and pray every day hold on and praise me every day so i look at that word like that every time i see it i had that little bird out there and i went out there yesterday and hope was shattered all over my porch. The first thing I thought is, hope shattered, that was mama's little bird. And then the next thing I thought, I thought, you devil, hope ain't <laughs> never shattered. Hope is never shattered. When you pray, a lame man can still get up. 
<laughs> when you pray, America could still get a touch from God. When we pray, God can still breathe on his church. Hoping the devil will tell you it's all shattered. It's all broke. Hope it, that's the first thing. I looked at that and I said, oh, hope is shattered. And the next thing, no, hope ain't shattered. Hope will never be shattered. Right? It's a moment of loss, but there's an answer. How long did that man lay at that gate begging? How long did he ask? And then finally, two people who were full of prayer and full of God on the way to pray again. They were loaded. Man, they were ready. They had, they had an answer for the need, right? We should be like that man. He got more than he expected. He got more than he expected, so didn't he? Expect when we pray to get more than we expected. Anybody else have an observation? What do you think about Peter and John? What do you think about this guy laying there? Just something different this day. Prayer qualifies. If you're going to use his name, you better have some prayer behind it. Because the devil, you know my grandson Jackson, I, I, we might end up with a little one-armed preacher for God. That boy has, has a one-armed trumpet player and he loved to play that trumpet, man. The other night he called me again. You know, he told me the dream uh, about going to heaven, seeing my dad and a lot of people. And a little bit he saw Jesus. Jesus said, Jackson, I got a surprise for you. And he said, Papa, he gave me my arm back. Wow, that knocked me out. He called me the other night. Did he call me or text me? I don't, but whatever, he got a hold of me. He said, Papa, he said, I had another dream the other night. And these demons were attacking. He said, man, it just come on me. And he said, I plead the blood. I rebuke you, devil of hell. I rebuke you, demons. And he said, you know what? They had to scatter. He said they scattered and they fled. Now this boy is 13, 14 years old. I said, thank you, Jesus. It's a gift. It's a gift, man. For God, for an old papa, for us. And I thought, wow. What make a kid like that dream that dream, but also learn that he could use the name of Jesus and that wow. demon. And I told him, I said, buddy, and that's exactly how it works. You remember that. I feel that witness of, of the Holy Ghost. So here it is, and I know we're about out of time. I wish we had four more hours. Now look, look what he said. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, Friend, it's in prayer where we get the authority to use his name. We can bootleg and we can try to pass the hour of prayer and throw his name around and some devil will strip us and leave us wounded and naked. But if we'll pray and then use the power of God's name, we'll have something to give to America and the lame around us, the lost, that God would have them all saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? Peter immediately, now you notice this, in prayer it gave him boldness in that authority when he saw him different that day and he sensed and he was led of the Holy Spirit and he knew that this is going to happen. You, know, you can have those moments, you can know that's who that's for, it's going to happen. And he just immediately, he took that, that lame guy by the right hand. Saints, I believe we're in an hour we can pray. We can give some people our right hand. Give them the name of Jesus, the love of God. God will pull them up. Some of them save them as a firebrand out of the pit of hell. Hey, the harvest is still all around us. I can tell you it's still harvest time. One of my favorites, every, every year I think about this verse. Summer is ended and harvest is past. You find that long about Jeremiah 8, 20. It's in Jeremiah. It said, summer is ended and harvest is past and we're not saved. It just touches me in a tender way. Nothing sad, nothing greater sorrow than to see harvest fall to the ground and be wasted and especially when it's an eternal soul look at it 
And when he grabbed him by the hand, friend, that prayer power, that authority of the name of Jesus, and Peter not only took him by the hand, he, he lifted him up, it says. But it was all in action, friend, something behind it, anointing by, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received his strength, and he leaping up stood. He hadn't been able to do that before. Money, but Ben, money wasn't going to do that for him. But what the preachers had could help. Saints, if we have his name and the power of his name and prayer behind us and God with us, uh, we, we can see this, this answer. We can see the need be met in Jesus' name. And immediately that miraculous took place. Ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked. And you know, we want to try to figure out how to get people to church. Hey, you won't even have to invite, invite them. Touch them and see them get their need met. And they'll just walk right on in the door with you. Right? He just followed them right on in. Huh? Time to pray, man. Walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising. You know what America needs to see is a move of God somewhere. You know what the church world, you know what our kids need, you know what Jackson needs? A move of God in the house of God. Yeah. Needs to see the saints pray. Needs to see the people of God help somebody who can't help themselves. We're going to let you run here in just a minute. And they knew it. The people saw it and knew it. I hope Pittsburgh sees some people in prayer Saturday. They knew that he was that man that asked him for two bits every day. They walked by him at the beautiful gate. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. Friend, prayer, the anointing of God, the touch of God will never fall of filling people full of wonder and amazement. Look at God. Look what God can do. Look what he did. This man is different. Somebody said the church can't say anymore that we don't have silver and gold, but they said the church world can't say they have the power anymore either. Amen. That's kind of an ugly statement, isn't it? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Well, now we say, well, we got silver and gold, but no power. Comes through prayer, comes through seeking God, comes through expectation, it comes from believing. All right. So it, it, it did something in the community. And the lame man which was healed held Peter. Can you see, see in that 11th verse in closing? It said, they held Peter and John and all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, you men of Israel, you men of America, why marvel you at this or why look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness? No, it's prayer power. It's a touch of God power. In what we done, it's what he'll do through us though. We had made this man to walk. The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son, Jesus Christ, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the Just One. You desired a murder to be granted unto you. What's America desiring tonight when they ought to, de they ought to desire the very God that gave them the greatest country on the earth? Huh? You killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead were of witnesses. And look what he said. It's through his name, through faith in his name that made this man strong whom you see now. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of all of you. In closing tonight, and you that have joined us by Facebook, but spread the word. Tell them we're going to be at Immigrant Park this coming Saturday, 2nd Broadway, downtown Pittsburgh, two hours of prayer. We're going to seek God for this nation. We're going to pray for ourselves. We're going to pray for our churches. We're going to pray for a move of God. We're going to pray for truth and reality. 
Not just a feel-good experience, but a move of God that can touch the hearts and the lives of people and touch this country. And we hope some of you join us. And you saints that are here tonight and gathered, pray for Brother Cliff Allman. Uh, Brother Cliff is in a real need of physical touch tonight. Sister Karen uh, was taken to the ER. I prayed with her, called on the name of the Lord. She don't even remember. Uh, her blood sugar was so low, she don't even remember us even having talked or, or, or anything like that. And so she has a real need in her body tonight. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this hour of study. Thank you, Lord, that we could come to your house. And, and God, you know the need for Brother Cliff Allman. You know the need tonight for Sister Karen Cox. Lord, so many other names in our church bulletin, our church family. Father, probably some watching us by Facebook. Lord, we've been praying for Sister Emma Jo. We love her and she loves you and been through so many things. And we just pray, God, that you touch her. And Father, all of, uh, of our people from our congregations who have been shut in these, these homes and these care facilities can't be in the house of God, can't come to the hour of prayer. But here we are in the hour of Bible study and prayer, and we're praying for them. And we pray that your power and your virtue, Lord, would go through uh, and out of this building tonight and touch the hearts and the lives of these people. God, I pray for America. I pray for truth. God, I pray for such a sobriety and a soberness. Come to this land. God, I, I pray for the peace of Israel. I pray for this election, God. I, I, I plead the blood against division. And God, I come against that spirit of violence and hatred. And, and, and God, the, the enemy of our soul uses division to conquer and to divide and, and to keep people apart and separated. But God, it's your will to draw men and women, boys and girls, that all might have the knowledge of truth and be saved. And the truth is, we need to pray through as a people. The truth is, God, we're in the middle of spiritual warfare, and the only thing that's going to penetrate it is the power of prayer, a move of the Spirit of God in this country. Start it right here in us. Start it in our sister churches. God, meet with us this coming Saturday. God, I pray for Franklin Graham. I pray for the March on Washington. I pray for Jonathan Kahn and his burden for the country and, and his cry for America to return to her founding and return to the God of the Bible. Lord, we join in those efforts tonight. Take us as we leave this house, never out of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, saints. Oh, yesterday. I